had told Paul in preaching the good news of salvation by grace. That's what this whole uh, chapter has been about, this whole uh, book of Galatians has been about so far, is that Paul had been preaching the good news of salvation by grace, and as he was doing that, the apostles also told him, this is what we talked about two weeks ago, to remember the poor. And I talked about how that, that is an outwork of our good works or our Serves to one another is an outpouring of our gratitude for receiving God's grace. It's not something that we earn our salvation by doing these works. It's not something that we earn God's favor in any way. But actually, because of God's grace, we are so thankful to Him for that grace that we naturally will then have love for Him and then love for one another. And in our love for one another, we talked about how the apostles even said, we only ask you to remember the poor. Even as we are living by grace, remember those who are less fortunate than you. We talked about that last uh, two Sundays ago. Now today we're going to see the importance of, therefore, standing firm in our salvation, which is by grace through faith and not by works. To stand firm in that foundation of grace. And you might think, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, if it's not by grace, it's by grace, not by works. I don't have to do anything. So what's the, what's, why do we have to stand firm? Well, because there are different times we are tempted because of human nature to add to God's grace. And we'll talk a little bit of that today. So previously, Paul had said in Galatians chapter uh, 1, verse 10, previously Paul had said, Galatians 1, verse 10, for I am now seeking the for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so Paul had said back in Galatians 1 verse 10 that people pleasers, those who seek to please God uh, man rather than God first. People pleasers do not make good disciples of Jesus Christ because they often seek to please man even before they want to please God. And that is a conflict that will lead to things that will not be the best of things in our relationship with, uh, with Christ. And so a controversy uh, arose between certain Jewish believers, not all of them, but certain Jewish believers who believe that Christians, that all Christians, Jews and Gentile Christians, should all follow the Jewish laws of circumcision and the kosher diet. 
There were certain Jew Jewish believers that said that even though we are saved by grace through faith, because the foundation of, of Christianity comes from Judaism, we don't deny that Jesus was Jewish, came from, the, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, came from the people of Israel, he is the Jewish Messiah. Therefore, they also believe that Christians, in their walk with God, through grace, should also follow the Jewish laws of circumcision. They should be circumcised, they should follow kosher diet. And then they believe that also that non-Jewish believers, at the same time, the non-Jewish believers, in contrast to the certain Jewish beliefs that they should follow a kosher diet and circumcision, certain non-Jewish believers were taught that salvation is by grace, through faith alone. There's no works to be added to it. It's just by grace, through faith. And so the controversy was which gospel, which good news is right? Was it the ones of the, the Jewish believers that were teaching? Certain ones? Or was it the one that the non-Jewish believers had been taught that salvation is by grace through faith alone and not by works? So Jesus' apostles actually had already discussed this very matter back in Jerusalem when in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, it says that, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up, well, these are believers, mind you, so some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. So back in Acts, this thing was already discussed. And their conclusion in discussing this matter, the apostle Peter declared clearly in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through grace, through the grace of our Lord Jesus, just as they would, meaning they the Gentiles. We Jewish believers believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they the Gentiles would. That's what Peter concluded. And so the matter had been already settled back in Acts 15 when they discussed this in Jerusalem what was called the Jerusalem Council. And so what basically they were concluding was that no additional works were required in order to be saved. That's the good news. Neither circumcision was required, nor following a kosher diet was required, or any of the other ceremonial Jewish laws. Salvation is only by grace through faith. Although the matter was already settled by the apostles in Jerusalem, as we just read in Acts 15, it became an issue once again here in Antioch, which was the location of the first Gentile Christian church. The first Gentile Christian church was in the city of Antioch. And that's where we pick it up today in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now what he's talking about, first of all, who's Cephas? Okay, Cephas is just the Hebrew name of Peter. Okay, Peter is Petros, rock in, in Greek. That's what we known for the apostle by, the apostle Peter, is also his name in Hebrew is Cephas, which also means rock in the Hebrew language. When he says Cephas, he's talking about Peter. Peter previously ate with Gentile believers, though their food wasn't kosher. He says Peter previously ate with Gentiles because they all knew that salvation was by grace alone, not by following the Jewish laws. And, and so, and not by following the dietary laws. But it says that in verse 11 and 12, that when certain men came from James, meaning Jewish believers from Jerusalem, when they came and visited with Peter, it says that Peter, quote, drew back and separated himself from the Gentile believers. Okay, that's what it says in verse 11. Uh, verse 12, for certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself. Why did Peter do this? Why was he eating with the Gentiles 
Because we're all just brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all saved by grace, Jews and Gentiles. Why would he be able to go along with that? Because salvation by grace through faith beforehand, but then when the Jewish believers from Jerusalem came from James, all of a sudden he withdrew from Gentiles and spent with eating with them, with fellowship with them. Why would Peter do this? Well, it says, because he, quote, feared the circumcision party, verse 12. Because he feared the circumcision party. The circumcision party means those who believe that all Christians must follow the Jewish laws, specifically of circumcision. So they were called the circumcision party. Maybe there are other believers that believe circumcision is required. Now, apparently, Peter was feeling pressured by these Jewish believers. And because he did not want to offend these Jewish believers, he stopped eating or associating with the Gentile believers. And so this obviously confused the Gentile believers because Peter had been fine with having fellowship with them before, but why now was this apostle, the apostle Peter, now avoiding them? Were the Gentile believers somehow second-class Christians? Is that why he was withdrawing from them? Was it there something deficient in their salvation, which was received by God's grace alone? Was that it? Was that why he was, he was withdrawing from them? And so in Peter's effort not to offend his Christian uh, uh, Jewish brothers, the Jewish believers, in his effort not to offend the Jewish believers, he ended up offending the Gentile believers by withdrawing from them, not associating with them. Here, here's my, you know, I, I had fun talking with you, and fellowshiping with you, and eating with you before, and now when my Jewish fellow uh, believers come, all of a sudden, it's like you guys have a plague, and I have to withdraw from you, and somehow I'm going to separate myself from everybody. Why? What, what, what is wrong? What is wrong with this? But more importantly than just offending them personally in their feelings, more important than that, the message of the good news of the salvation by grace was called into question. Therefore, the Apostle Paul, when he saw this, felt it necessary to do what? Verse 11. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And so because what Peter had been doing was in public, publicly withdrawing from his Gentile believers when formerly he had no problem uh, fellowship with them with before and eating with them before, Paul then felt or felt that it was necessary to oppose Peter to his face. It was a confrontation over the very message of the gospel. Is the salvation that we preach by grace or is it not? Or do we are we saying that we need to follow Jewish laws? Because by your actions you seem to be denying Salvation by grace, when Peter had just been preaching that salvation is by grace. Peter knew that what the Jewish, these Jewish believers were preaching, that Gentiles needed to follow the Jewish laws, was already decided, as we said, in Jerusalem to be false. Okay? That was back in Acts 15. Peter had already said, Acts 15, verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our of the Lord Jesus, just as they would be. He already said that. Peter had already established that. So we knew that Peter believed that. It was already decided by the apostles in Jerusalem to be false. So therefore, Peter was knowingly aligning himself with what was false. A false gospel. That salvation needs to also have added to it following Jewish laws. And therefore, Peter Paul says, he stood condemned. I opposed him to his face, verse 11. Because he stood condemned, meaning liable to judgment. That's serious. Liable to judgment. He's negating the good news of grace. So the issue here was much more than just hurting someone's feelings. Okay, that's not the issue. The issue here was heresy. Heresy. Advocating a false gospel of salvation. A salvation that was supposed to be by works of the law. That's heresy. It's a heretical teaching 
that's on, on major issues. Here it's about salvation. When there's heretical teaching on major issues, that cannot be tolerated in God's church. And so, when Cephas came to India, Paul opposed Peter to his face, one apostle to another, because he stood condemned. Because the issue was not some hurt feelings. The issue was the very salvation upon which the good news was established. And so in the days ahead, even today, there will be false teachers. It says in God's word, there will be false teachers. And there will be false teachings. Not talking about just political things or talking about issues that have nothing to do with major issues like salvation in the Bible. We're talking about major theological heretical teaching. Not just this little people. You've got to be careful on what we call you know, uh, false teachers here. We're not talking about just political you know, charlatans. We're talking about major heretical issues that fundamentally deny foundational truths of the good news. Purposely teaching false gospels. That's what we're talking about. It says false teachers and false teachings will increase. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false news. Now, mind you, this is not talking about just someone who just says false things, you know, like a politician or just saying, this is actually heretical teaching in God's church. Heretical teaching by people who call themselves pastors or teachers or they put themselves on YouTube and, or whatever. This is the kind of false teaching that is to come and is already here. False prophets also arose among the people, God's people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So we've got to be careful on what we call false teaching. We're not talking about these people that just say things you disagree with. Okay? We're talking about actual doctrinal issues, the matter of which they're of great importance, like what Peter was talking about and Paul was talking about here, that have heretical implications in, of, of God's truth. Okay? That's what he's talking about. That will occur. Foundational issues like salvation will be in jeopardy. Okay? And you can kind of see what, like, what they're talking about here. Because they'll bring in destructive, uh, secretly bring in destructive errors. He's not going to say, hey, I'm teaching something different here. They're going to act like, well, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian here. I'm, I'm a pastor. I have you know, such and such a church, and this is what I teach. And so they're going to see, you know, they're going to secretly bring in these destructive heresies, denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality. It's going to be self serving because of the way, of, uh, because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. Exploit you with false things. So that is to come. And that's what we need to be careful. Be careful of. And be mindful of. And the way that we discern the truth from error is by knowing this book. Knowing God's word will help us determine what's false or what's true from his word. And so our first point this morning is that we must know what the good news of salvation by grace is. First, Understand what salvation by grace is, and then you can guard against false gospels. Not the other way around. You don't go start chasing around, well, that's false, and that's false. You're a false teacher. No, no. Find out and establish, first of all, what is salvation by grace, and then you can establish what is false. What's false teaching? What is a true danger to the good news of Jesus Christ? Now, in Peter's case, not only did he stop eating with and associating with Gentile believers, but in verse 13, it says, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, meaning Peter, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And so, as we said, Peter had been eating with the Gentile believers fine before the Jewish believers came. Everything was fine. All brothers and sisters in Christ saved by grace, and 
then, when the Jewish believers from Jerusalem came, he withdrew from them. And now in verse 13 it says, Now the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter. And so Peter was such an influential apostle, he's the apostle Peter, that when he withdrew from associating with non-Jewish Christians, the other Jewish believers started doing the same thing. Even Barnabas, it says. Barnabas, if you knew, was Paul's closest ministry partner who shared the good news along with him to the Gentiles. Even Barnabas, it says, was also led astray by the hypocrisy. And so when people hear the word hypocrisy, they typically mean, and they usually mean when they say hypocrisy, they usually mean not practicing what you preach, right? That's the common definition of what hypocrisy means. Basically, you don't practice what you preach. But that's actually not how the word hypocrisy is used here in the Bible. That's actually not the biblical definition of what hypocrisy is. Okay? That's not the way that hypocrisy is used here in these verses. Okay? When the Bible uses the word hypocrite, it refers specifically to an actor who puts on a mask to play part in a, a performance. Okay. So if you think of an actor, like in a uh, Greek tragedy or something, they put on a mask in order to play a part in their, their performance. Okay. When you carry that over to this situation, it means concealing one's true character. It means concealing one's true thoughts. It means concealing one's true feelings by pretending to be something he is not. Okay? So that's what a hypocrisy means. Concealing one's character, thoughts, or feelings by pretending to be something he is not. And so here in Peter's case, what he was doing was he was concealing his true beliefs, his true convictions about the good news that salvation is by grace alone. Because we know full well that Peter believed that. He preached that. Salvation is by grace alone. But what he was doing here, when the Jews came, the Jewish believers, he was concealing those true convictions about the good news and was pretending to accept the Jewish believers' belief that the Gentile believers needed to live by Jewish law. You see what he was doing? He was pretending. It's not what he really believed. If that's what hypocrisy is, in the Bible, the biblical term, it's concealing what one truly is or truly believes, his true convictions, fully well knowing what the truth is, but pretending to accept certain Jewish believers' belief that the Gentile believers needed to follow Jewish laws and then be circumcised in order to be saved. <clears throat> but Paul knew that's not what Peter believed at all. And that's why Paul confronted him. Peter, you know full well the gospel is by grace alone. Paul knew that Peter preached salvation that is only by grace through faith and not by doing any works of the law. Acts chapter 15, verse 6, back in Acts 15, when they had this, it says, Peter now, Peter said to this, what did Peter say in Acts 15, verse 6? Peter said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Okay, so it says, by, by my mouth, Peter says, the Gentiles, not Jews, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, meaning the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our, nor our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So Peter already established that salvation is by grace alone. Right there in Acts 15, in his own, in his own words. And Paul knew full well, and Peter knew full well what he believed. And so the question is, so why then was Peter pretending like this? Why was he avoiding the Gentile believers that he had just been eating with? If he knew the truth, that is salvation by grace, why is he avoiding them? Why did he withdraw from the, not the, the Gentile believers when the Jewish believers came? 
And the answer is because he did it to appease, to appease certain Jewish believers so they wouldn't be offended by his evil agenda. To appease them so they would not be offended. See, but what Peter probably didn't realize was that by his example, the other Jewish believers would also follow along with him and avoid associating with the Gentile believers. Did Peter, Barnabas, and all these other Jewish believers actually believe that the Gentile believers needed to follow the Jewish laws in order to be saved? Not so. Not at all. Okay. Peter already established in the Jerusalem Council that salvation is the light grace. And so if Barnabas did not believe that, that Jews or uh, Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to be saved, if Peter did not believe that either, and the other Jewish believers who were led astray by Peter's actions did not believe that, why were they doing this? Why were they withdrawing? And so because they believed one thing about the gospel, but pretended to believe something else, that's what we call play acting, and that's what we call the Bible calls hypocrisy. Not just not practicing what you preach, it's believing one truth but pretending to believe another. That's what hypocrisy is. They were play acting, they were pretending. And that's the biblical definition of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is not simply not practicing what you preach, there is a lack of, in, that, that's just a lack of integrity when you don't practice what you preach. That's, that's different. Hypocrisy is knowing something to be true, but intentionally covering it up to make it seem like you don't believe what you preach. Because you knew salvation is by grace alone. But now, because of pressure from these Jewish believers from Jerusalem, you are now, quote, forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews, as it says in verse 14. How is he forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews? By refusing to associate with them unless they were circumcised. And unless they follow the Jewish dietary laws, like the Jews did. It's only kosher foods, not unclean foods, that are considered unclean by the by Jews. So you're putting pressure on the Gentiles and forcing them to live like Jews. And Peter knew full well that in pressuring the Gentiles to live like Jews, he was essentially negating the good news of salvation by grace. Peter's play acting was, quote, not in step, Paul says, with the truth of the gospel. And Peter knew it. The basis of the good news by grace through faith alone was at stake here. It's not just a minor little thing like, oh, you hurt someone's feelings. No, it's much greater than that. The whole issue of the gospel is either by grace alone or it isn't. That was what, what was at stake. So failing to live according to what we know to be true is a challenge for every believer in Christ. That's what was, was here the issue with Peter. Now he's the apostle Peter. He actually had this. He fell into not or, or, or pretending that he didn't believe what he knew to be true. But that's something that we all deal with. Failing to live according to what we know to be true is a challenge for every believer in Jesus Christ, including myself. Do I always live according to what I know to be true? Do you? Do any of us always live according to what we knew to be true? See, that's a challenge for every believer in Christ. It's especially a challenge for those of us who are parents, for example. Because we know that our children know, know, will know, if or whether or not we truly believe what we say we believe. They'll know. Or whether we're just planned. Children can tell that that yet, after years of doing it, if you really believe what you say you believe, or you're just play acting. Because we're all sinners, saved only by grace. No one, no one always practices what they preach. We know it is. So in that sense, we are all hypocrites. In that common definition of the word, right? We're all hypocrites. In that we all fail to live up to our own ideas at times. And so the challenge for us is are we, all, are we honest about our failures? 
Are we honest about our failings when we fail to live up to what we know to be true? Are we honest about that even as we love and even as we discipline our children? See, that's the challenge for parents, right? If we know that we're imperfect, as we all are, because there's no perfect parents, how then can we teach our children? That's one of the children, right? That's the challenge. Well, the answer is by being honest about our feelings, even as we love, and even as we discipline sometimes our own children. Because you see, if a parent comes across as if they never sin on one extreme, right? If they never sin, never act unlovingly, they are only play acting, right? That's just play acting. As it says in 1 John chapter 8, or chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now think about it in terms of parenting, for example. If we say that we are perfect, but we don't sin, you deceive yourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So on one extreme, if a parent comes across as if they never sin, they never act on money, they're just play acting. But that's not true at all. It says in verse 1. If you say you're not a sinner, you're just making Jesus to be a liar. Because he died for your sins. And you're claiming you're without sin. Now on the other hand, on the other extreme, just because we as parents are only sinners saved by grace, which is true, that does not relieve us of our responsibility to love our children enough to sometimes discipline them. See, that's the challenge, right? Sometimes people just, just give up, well, I can't tell them what to do because I'm not perfect either. You're wrong. Okay? What does the scripture say? We have a responsibility to love our children enough to discipline them, even though we are sinners saved by grace. What does Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 say? Whoever spares the rod hates his son. You hate them if you, if you spare the rod. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him, though we are sinners. You see that? Proverbs 19, verse 18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Okay? By not disciplining him, you're just setting him up for failure. You're setting him up for spiritual death. Because you don't love them enough to discipline them, even though you're just a sinner saved by grace. So that's the challenge. And that's not only a challenge for us as parents, that's a challenge for us as all believers, right? How can we tell others and we preach the good news about salvation and, and talk about the, the good news of salvation when we ourselves are imperfect? But that's the challenge, right? Be honest. Yes, I'm a sinner, only saved by grace. And yet the good news, because I love you, the good news is you can be saved too by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not relinquish from us or excuse us from sharing the good news or loving others just because we're imperfect people. Nor does it be relieving us of our responsibility to love our children enough to discipline them just because we want to. You see how that works? It's a challenge. Definitely. But it doesn't relieve us of the responsibility to love them enough to discipline them, though we are sinners saved by grace. Okay, so we are honest about that. We don't come across as perfect. You know, we're definitely not that. But we don't come across as, you know, I can't really do anything because I have no right to share anything because I'm just a sinner too. No, that's the reason why we share the good news. So whoever spares the rod hates his son, but whoever did loves him is diligent to discipline him. That's what Proverbs 13 says. And so if you say, for example, that you love your children, but refuse to discipline them, you are just play acting. You don't really love them. Don't tell me that you love your children if you don't even have the heart to discipline them. Because some people think, they confuse the fact that, well, I can't discipline them, I don't want to yell at them, I don't want to hurt their feelings, because, because I love them so much. No, you're actually doing the opposite. You're not loving them at all. The scripture clearly says if you love them, you'll be careful to discipline. So if you say you love your children, for example, but refuse to discipline them, discipline them, you are play-acting. 
So play acting can work both ways. When a parent is unduly harsh, when we say that they're not sinners, like that first John says, you say you have no sin, you see your sons. You say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar. Yeah, that's one extreme. That's play acting. Or it's also play acting when you're unduly permissive. I don't discipline them because, you know, I used to do the same thing and, you know, and you're saying you don't love your children. Proverbs 13. So play acting works both ways. When you're unduly permissive or you're unduly harsh and not honest about your own feelings. You see how challenging that is? Okay. But that not only to a parent, that's also a challenge for us as all of us as believers in Jesus Christ. We share the good news though we are imperfect. I am imperfect, yet I'm still a pastor. How is that so? Because I'm saved by grace. I always stand here by grace. And so how can we avoid this play acting, which is what the Bible calls hypocrisy? How can we avoid this? And the answer is, we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Always. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Don't worry so much about failing as a parent or as a believer that you become paralyzed. Sometimes the people you know, get paralyzed in their faith or paralyzed as a parent. I can't function. I don't know what to do because I'm so worried about failing. No. Don't worry so much about failing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't worry about what others think or say about you. Because it doesn't matter. It's only what Jesus thinks about you that matters to us before him. Whether or not others approve of you or not, Jesus is the one that saves you, who loves you. Focus on pleasing God, and he will help you as you reach out to him for help. Because we all need help, right? Are we not? We all need help. I'm, hopefully, what you're getting from what I'm saying about, like, say, parenting is that you need help. Okay? You need help as a parent. I need help as a parent. I pray every day for myself as a parent, as a husband, okay, as a believer. Because I knew that left my own devices, I would just mess things up and mess my kids up even more than I already had. And it's only by grace that they're not as messed up more than they are. <laughs> right? And that's just honest. And that's what every parent needs to be doing. You get on your knees every day and you say, Jesus, help me. Help me to be a better believer. Help me to be a better husband. Help me to be a better parent because I will mess things up if I, if I don't have your help. And that's the truth. Focus on pleasing God and he will help you as you reach out to him for aid. Also, don't underestimate the power of prayer. I pray every single day for each one of you in our church. I pray for every one of you every day. I pray for my children every day. You need to be doing that as well, if you're a parent. You need to be praying for your children every day. Sometimes they say, oh, well, how long do I have to do this? Forever. Okay, it's a challenge. But I know I'll fail. So just get used to it. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your children. Pray, and I pray for this church. I pray for every person I, I name in this church. Most of all, trust in Jesus to keep you on the right path. Trust him. See, you don't want to be so paralyzed. Oh, I might fail. I'm, I'm a sinner and I can't really do the right thing. You're right. You can't do the right thing on your own. You know what? Trust in God, not yourself. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, we'll close with this. Trust in the Lord. Okay, doesn't trust in yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Oh, what I think is best. This is what I think. Doesn't matter what you think. Do not lean on your own understanding, Proverbs 3 says. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. See, he's going to do it, not you. If your kids turn out to be good, don't take credit for that. Okay? If your kids turn out to be better than you expected, that's God's grace. Praise Him. If your marriage lasts longer than you expected, it's because of God's grace. If you do anything as a believer that's of any value, of eternal value, that's God's grace. 
But he will make straight the paths. He does it, not me. And if and when you fall, as we all do, come back to grace. Because that's what Galatians is about. Come back to grace. If Jesus said you were still worthy of, of salvation, then you are, whether you feel that like you are or not. You may feel miserable. I'm a miserable failure. I've blown it. God still loves you. He's still dying for you. And if you confess your sins, he's, like it says in 1 John, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. See, we keep in step with the good news by being honest about our feelings, our failings. We keep in step with the good news by being honest about our failings. Just be honest. I'm a sinner. As a parent, as a husband, as a believer as a pastor. At the same time, while trusting enough to love. Because that's what love essentially requires. It requires the trust to be able to love others enough to sometimes discipline them as we do our children, as enough to share the good news as we do with others. But we trust the Lord enough to love. We must know what salvation by grace is as opposed to false gospels. And act according to what you know to be true. We are to be honest about our failings while being loving and trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have shown us the truth of ourselves. Sinners saved by grace, though we are. And here has been given this great privilege of being able to be your people and share the good news with those who have not yet heard. And also, as parents, to love our children enough to even discipline them and show them the right path, though we ourselves are not perfect ourselves. We're imperfect people in this one nature. We're imperfect. Pastor who are imperfect Christians, though we are called to share the good news. So help us be honest with our own families and be loving to speak the 